Welcome to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. I'm Amanda. And I'm Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, Elizabeth. Well, it's just us today. How's your How'd your weekend go? I saw you had the baby in a game. Yeah, we went to a football game, sat through the rain to see Purdue take a big L to Ohio State. <laughs> but overall, we, we had a great time. And probably one of the highlights of the trip was we got to see what harvest progress looks like across most of Indiana and even into Illinois a little bit. We continued our trip a little further west. Yeah, how's things look out there? I was pretty surprised. It seems like they're a little further along than we are. But yeah, watching the corn come off through there gets me excited for the next couple of weeks here in Ohio. Is <laughs> hopefully harvest keeps rolling right along for us. Yeah, they were a little drier up that way all year. I think right? so. Yeah. Parts of it. We certainly have made a little progress in Ohio, but a little bit behind normal. So yeah. I guess, and we'll talk about a few things here today to help you if you're a little that will hopefully help you if you're a little nervous about corn still in the field. Yeah, because recently we we sat down with Aaron Wilson and we talked about the season's weather. And one of the topics that we talked about was just with the reduction and accumulation of growing degree days, how far behind we really were. And since we talked to him, we did have some pretty warm weather, unseasonably warm for this time of year, but we still didn't manage to catch up in a lot of the state we're still looking at the crop being about two weeks behind. We're kind of hearing reports of high moisture, um, not as bad as it has been. I think around here, you know, mid 20s, low 20s, probably. Um, Of course, if you didn't pick up on Elizabeth's story about Ohio State versus Purdue, we are recording this on the 18th. So it'll be Uh, about a week before you all hear it. So those numbers will hopefully come down a little, but um, we're going to share some information with you about maybe not a whole lot at this point in time going through the rest of the season. So we're going to talk about some grain drying information to help you understand what you can expect to see the end of October into November given the current weather outlook. I guess to provide some background, I threw some numbers in here. And for those of you who are visual, I know it's kind of (laughs) hard to listen to podcasts with a lot of numbers. I struggle with that. But just to give you some perspective on temperatures um, over the past years and crop progress and those kinds of things, we just want to recap a little bit. In last year in October, our average temperature turned out to be about 66.8 degrees. 21 was 70 degrees. So apparently October was warm that year. I don't remember that really. But <laughs> um, and then in 2020, it was cooler, 65, just under 65 degree average. But all of those years we had above average growing degree days when you look at the U2U tool, which we'll talk a little bit about at the end of the podcast. So how's that compare with this year, Elizabeth? So this year we've really flipped the script on the weather story. Um, The average as of today is not quite 70 degrees, but if we look back Um, We did have that little warm stretch there at the end Mm -hmm. of September and early October. Um, We're still below average in our GDDs. I looked for my house specifically, and we're about 200 growing degree units below normal this time of year. So when you think about how many days that is, you know, it comes out to that about two weeks. And you can really see that reflected in the crop progress. Yeah, and I think that's really what we're dealing with right now is that While October may turn out to be about average, I don't know, maybe a little bit below, depending on the next week or two here, but just consistently, we've never caught up with our growing degree days this year. Yeah, you can really see it in that U2U tool. Really, the very early beginnings of June is when we split off from the trend line. And in fact, you know, it was a pretty big jump when we had the cool temperatures then where we lost traction and we never had a stretch where we caught up, where it got really warm. And in fact, um, through a lot of the summer, the gap between normal growing degree units and what we were accumulating this year just kept getting wider. Yeah, which is kind of crazy to think about. But then when you remember 
what things were like. I mean, it does make sense. And then I guess to compare that with our planting progress, reflect back on that a little bit. You know, the beginning of May, we were only had about 11% of our corn planted. This is based off of the Ohio Crop and Weather Report, which was 6% below average. And then the next week, we were 26% planted. And then finally, May 21st, we had two-thirds of the corn planted, and that was actually 14% above normal. So we went from being below normal to being above normal. But, you know, the end of May is when you're really starting to think about, do I need shorter season hybrids, you know, depending on growing degree days and stuff, which you can't predict, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. And thinking back, that stretch when a lot of that corn was planted was when we were really starting to see the effects of that flash drought that we had here in Ohio. So a lot of that corn, even though it was put in the ground, um, it took a couple weeks to come up. We talked about that here on the podcast and the concerns around that. And we're seeing with that cooler than normal summer, that corn planted late May, especially that might not have come up in early June, really struggling to finish off this season. Yeah, that's a great point. And we've seen the corn behind maturity, you know, it varied from week to week, but seven to 10%. So the delays and emergence and then the growing degree days being lower have just continued us through this trend to the point where we're behind our five-year harvest progress. Well, this is for the week ending 10-15. We're about 6% higher on our moisture than the five-year average, and that's at 26%. So we're probably going to be down around the low 20s by the time this comes out. But that is what we're here to talk about today, is that we're dealing with this higher moisture. Even though it may be lower by the time the podcast comes out, it's still kind of going to continue that trend for the season of being behind average. And how do we deal with that? Yeah, and I think your information is coming from a local elevator. So also keep in mind, a lot of the corn they're seeing might have been dried on farm before it's coming in on the truck. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that average is going to be a little bit lower from what's coming out of the field directly. We wanted to talk a little bit about field dry down. I know a lot of you guys are having to dry corn on the farm, but that is a big cost. So anytime you can let moisture come off from the help of nature, is obviously the most cost effective way. But we know that as we move through fall, the ability of the corn to dry in the field is going to be reduced. In September, we usually expect to see about a half to one point coming off per day. And then once we get into October, on average, we go down to only losing about a quarter to a half percent per day. Um, Obviously, it's going to be better in early October. But as we move into the tail end of October, with the cooler temperatures, we, we aren't going to expect to see as much moisture come off each day. The bad news is once November hits, dry down is going to stall out. Comes to a screeching halt. <laughs> it well, does. maybe not that extreme, but yeah. Yeah, we'll have some good days here and there that might take off a little bit. But overall, we see very little moisture coming off of that corn in the field. Again, this is going to depend on weather, especially temperature, humidity, and rain, which luckily so far we haven't had a lot of rain to slow things down. And we do currently have a warm-up in the forecast, which should be happening right about the time you're listening to this if it plays out. And this might help us take some of that moisture out before November hits. One other consideration for dry down in the field is whether that corn has reached full maturity yet. And we commonly call that black layer. That's when that kernel seals off from the stalk. And from that point on, the moisture that we lose from the corn really just comes out of the kernel and not back through the cob and the plant. So the corn that was planted in late May in the drought affected areas of the state is likely just now reaching black layer due to that delayed emergence that we talked about. Up till now, we've had a few light frosts in some areas and a killing frost is probably just around the corner given the history across Ohio. So once we see those cold conditions, the plant tissue in that corn, that later corn is going to die and it's going to dry down much more quickly than the grain itself does. So you may over the next couple of weeks get into some fields that you think from the road look really dry, but you're going to be surprised that the moisture in that corn is higher than you expect. Again, with those fields looking at the weather conditions that are typical this time of year, you shouldn't expect big changes in moisture in those fields if you wait, since our prime field drying conditions are most likely behind us. This information, 
comes partly from a study that Peter Thomason did uh, when he was here, and that he found that grain moisture decreased about 6% between October and November harvest dates. Uh, but then once you reach early to mid-November, um, there's almost no grain drying at all, as you mentioned, Elizabeth. But 90% of the yield loss associated with delayed corn harvest occurs when they delayed beyond no mid-November. And most of us like to be done by Thanksgiving for sure, so that's not an ideal situation, but it does happen. So being able to get that corn out of the field in a timely manner is important, but also like don't hang it, let it hang out in the field in November uh, because you think you might get a few points off of it. It's not going to happen in a typical year. I suppose we could end up with an abnormal November where we've got 70 degrees, but typically not going to happen. And you, but you drastically increase your risk of mold or stock rot um, damage occurs. And that's going to probably cause more yield loss than um, any drying benefit that you're going to get. Yeah, I think that's one of the things when we talk about that delayed harvest that becomes a concern. Um, I think a lot of folks I've talked to think we have good stock quality out there this year, but we know it degrades really quickly once we get into fall. And the other thing we've learned from talking to Aaron over the years is the trend is towards those wetter falls. Um, so if we do get in a situation where we're getting a lot more rain events that come with wind, um, you can't pick those ears up off the ground. So even if it wasn't in your plans for on-farm drying, it may be something to think about and go ahead and get that wet corn out and get it dried down another way so that you have corn to take to the elevator. Yeah, that's a really good point. We talked a little bit before about storage issues and having capacity on the farm. And that's certainly a struggle and it's a big capital investment to to increase that. So I think that's something you need to think about for the future of your farm and grain management. Um, if you don't want to be sitting in lines, you know, five hours or more um, or taking big docks and prices because of that issue. What are some cost-effective strategies that you're able to afford on your farm? Certainly grain drying is the main one we think of. There's also like natural air drying. There's information available on that if you don't want the expense. And how you can do that and how it might work on your farm and in our climate is something you can investigate as well. Yeah, I don't think I've ever talked to anyone who regretted increasing their farm grain storage capacity. I think it's one of those things that while it's a short-term investment that seems quite large, that it pays off dividends in the future because it allows you with proper grain management to take advantage of price boosts in the future by being able to hold onto that grain and not have to get it out the farm gate when prices are going to historically be the lowest at harvest. That's a good point. I mean, most of the time when I talk to farmers who've done that, they're pretty much excited about it and no one's like, oh, I shouldn't have spent that money. <laughs> but of course, you have to have the ability to do that. And we could probably get our our management co-hosts to talk a little bit about um, the payback period on something like that. I'm sure there's some information out there because you can take advantage of those market market pricing a little bit better. But if you are putting um, grain into a bin that's wet, uh, just keep in mind your storage time. There's charts readily available on the internet that show based on the moisture and the temperature uh, what you can expect as a safe storage time. So for example, at 20% moisture and 50 degrees, which is probably what a lot of you may be putting in right now, maybe a little bit wetter than that even, it only lasts a little over 60 days, so two months. Uh, so for long term, you really want to make sure you get it down to 15% and then cool it as the temperatures outside cool. Remember, we're talking about grain temperature, not ambient air, and that grain can hold its temperature for quite a while, which is nice in the spring as temperatures start to warm up, but you need to get it cooled down in the fall too. So you can run your fans, you know, during cool 
days when it's low humidity and help with that. If you're looking for ways to avoid the long lines at the elevator and considering alternative storage like grain bags or something like this, these would still apply. If you're putting wet grain into a bag, just (laughs) keep an eye on that and try to get it into your dryer as soon as possible or to the elevator as soon as possible to avoid mold issues, insect issues, things like that. Yeah, we'll link in the notes to a past episode where we talked with Ken Helvang about grain drying and storage. Um, That's a great resource to really brush up on that grain storage before you um, commit to putting a lot in your bins this fall. Ken's a great resource and really, I don't know, the only one who's focusing on grain drying a whole lot across the extension landscape. I don't know why that is, Elizabeth. Do you have any insight being an ag engineer? I don't. It's something that is really important and every few years comes up. You know, we really, it seems like every few years we have issues with grain quality or high moisture corn going into storage. So it's an important area of research, but it just doesn't seem to be something that gets folks excited on the research side, I guess. Yeah, I don't know if there's any budding ag engineers out there you might consider that as a, maybe it's not as sexy as some other things, though. Well, some things to consider, I guess, for the future to avoid situations, and you've probably thought about these and hopefully have implemented some as well. If planting is going as planned, everything's going smoothly just practicing staggering your hybrid maturity or your planting date so you're spreading out your corn maturity. That helps you avoid harvesting into late November, harvesting corn that's been mature for a month or more, and you may start seeing these stock issues or um, ear rots and things like that. I would be remiss if I didn't bring up data quality in this whole discussion. Yeah. (laughs) As we're going through these fields, um, we know with the variability we've seen in dry down and just other stresses throughout the season that we're gonna see variability in moisture in the field and test weight. And when we talk about data quality, those are two things that we know can really impact the quality of your calibration. So I'm a broken record, but looking Mm -hmm. at making sure that that calibration, checking it regularly as you move through the season and as you enter fields that have big differences in moisture or test weight, taking the time to recalibrate so that your data quality doesn't suffer as well. Yep. Great reminder. And it doesn't hurt too to keep an eye on your other combine settings, um, making sure the fans and things like that aren't blowing grain out as you get into lower test weights, just making adjustments as the conditions change this season. Yeah. And if planting is delayed, consider those weather conditions. Planting a shorter season hybrid might be in the books. You know, if you're getting into June, I don't know. It's probably a risk at this point to plant your full season hybrid. Um, Sometimes we can get away with it. uh, Sometimes we can't. So I would I would opt for exchanging it for a shorter season hybrid. What would you do, Elizabeth? Yeah, it's tough to say because the last few years we talked about having that higher than normal GDD. So we've really gotten into the habit of almost expecting that we're going to have that longer season Um, and be safe, even with those later planting dates. But, you know, every once in a while, we're going to get that year that burns us. So maybe this (laughs) will the one that we're due for for a while and we're clear, hopefully for the next few years. Yeah, of course, last year we ran into that too. Folks were worried about reaching black layer and or was it an early frost? I just remember having that conversation with a few people. Yeah, last year, I think we had an earlier frost, but then it stayed pretty warm. So We still saw that grain dry, albeit a little slower than we expected. So I guess it depends on what kind of risk taker you are. (laughs) We've talked about conditions generally. If you have fields that you're personally concerned about maturing, a great resource that Amanda and I both use a lot is the U2U GDD tracker. Um, It allows you to enter your location, your planting date, and your hybrid maturity, and then see estimates of crop development milestones based on the historical weather conditions. And it's a tab I think I've had open on my computer pretty much all season, um, yeah. just checking the the progress and seeing, playing out different scenarios. And so if you put in that information for your individual field, it will give you an estimate of when it'll black layer, 
And from there, you can get an idea of when that field might be ready to harvest. It comes up, you know, when we're in these delayed planting situations, you can put your hybrid maturity in there and see is if I plant this today, is it going to reach black layer or when is it expected to? Of course, it's, you know, based on weather predictions, past averages, the average GDDs we were talking about earlier come from this, you know, in an average year, although Aaron says, you know, averages are made up of highs and lows and whether we actually see that play out in an actual year is uh, not very often. Yeah. So when you're thinking about changing maturities or even deciding on which maturities you're going to plant as you make your seed selection over the next few weeks here, considering adjusting that so you can adjust your harvest time, you can use that tool as well to see, well, how early would this be ready and when it could be done. And I think it's great too, if you're going to try cover crops, you can get an idea of when it's expected. You can track it throughout the year to see, well, am I going to be able to plant a certain type of cover crop or do I need to change that up as well? Because I'm probably not going to get harvested as early. So hopefully this helps you think through some things and helps you make some decisions here over the next few weeks as you are finishing up corn harvest. Yields are looking good, so we just need to make sure we get that corn out of the field in a good condition so you can have a good return profit on that field. Yeah, I think that is the bright spot in all of these discussions. Um, Despite all the challenges this season, yields are looking pretty good. Alrighty, so we'll link up some of the resources we mentioned and uh, have a good rest of harvest to everyone out there. Thanks for listening to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. Join us again in two weeks for our next episode. Hey, podcast listeners. Just a reminder to give us a like or subscribe so you know when we release new episodes. If you're enjoying the podcast, be sure to leave us a review also. We appreciate the comments.